Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Ultimate D2C Operation Stack webinar. Um, today, we're going to discuss strategies for growing and future proofing your brand. Um, the last three months have been completely crazy, um, and underlying all of the gains and losses is in e-commerce is uh, an operational foundation. Um, so we're gonna go over some of the tools that you could use to build resiliency um, and ensure that you're uh, surviving and thriving in this environment. Um, I'm gonna go over a few webinar logistics. Uh, first up, we have some polls for each of our uh, presenters today. That'll be on the right-hand side. You'll see a tab with polls. Um, a poll will launch at the beginning of each section. Um, so be sure to answer them um, and you'll see the results in real time. Questions. Uh, we have a questions tab as well on the right-hand side. Uh, feel free to ask questions of the speakers um, and we'll be sure to answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, lastly, I will also be uploading resources as the presenters um, share, share their slides. Uh, if you're interested in any of the resources, uh, they'll be available in the chat. So here are some of the things we're gonna cover today. We're gonna learn a little bit about using a multi-channel approach to build brand resiliency. Uh, we're gonna talk about growing your manufacturing network outside of China. Forecasting customer demand to optimize inventory and diversifying supply and demand, uh, a little bit of network and design uh, in 2020 and beyond. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, Chad Rubin. And we're gonna talk about building an operation stack to survive and thrive in a post COVID world. Chad, take it away. Chad, you're up. Yeah, sorry about that. My connection was scattered. So thanks everyone for joining. I'm Chad Rubin here. I'm really uh, thankful that we have some awesome partners joining us today. And hopefully we can drop some incredible knowledge for everybody that's tuning in. Uh, I miss there's an incredible backdrop of things that are happening. Uh, and yet we all have to continue, try to continue to do business as usual here. Uh, and so today we're just talking about how we're going to work through uh, what you're experiencing and building a foundation from the ground up to sort of like when times get tough, you got to really just pull together and see what you can do to optimize and improve. And I do that on a personal level and I do that on a business level as well. Uh, I, I've been in e-commerce for 10 years. I started an e-commerce company where we manufacture very unsexy vacuum filters and coffee filters and air filters. And we started, we started building Stubana out of my own pain. And so, Stubana really is a result of what I went through as a brand and merchant. And now we offer Stubana as an operational platform to automate hundreds of companies uh, that are selling direct to consumer right now. Some of them are listed on the screen and a lot of them are listed on our brand new site that we just launched uh, two days ago. So without further ado, let's just get into like the specifics of what we're going to discuss today. I'm hoping everyone can see the screen as I'm pushing through these slides. It's the first time I'm using this uh, for slide present presentation. But essentially what's happened really is that $200 billion has went from offline to online. And so, and that's happened at a very accelerated pace. And so right now, like there's a lot of beneficiaries from what's happened in the environment that's happening right now. And given the devastation and the uncertainty, certainly a lot of companies have been able to grow and growth is possible. You just have to double down and know where to look. So if you look at what's happening right now in e-commerce, and if we go to the following slide, you'll see the categories, the sort of shift in where spending has gone given COVID, right? You'll see it's a lot of it's gone to essentials. People are spending more time indoors. Baby products are essential. Toys, health and wellness, working from home, office equipment, et cetera. And you look that it is so divided, not just like this country, but also look at this graph here. The left 
everything's weighted towards these essentials. And you look at the right, jewelry, luxury, automotive, fashion, outdoor, electronics, uh, all, and travel has have pretty much came to a, a halt or are seeing negative growth. Uh, and it's truly in my belief that I think that there's going to be a shift, especially as we get back to whatever that new normal looks like, people are going to want to deviate back to the norm of what they were doing. And we're going to see a big shift in where that where those dollars are going. So you have to just have that intuition and foresight to see how can you actually like capitalize on some of the momentum as there's a shift, as proximity, social distancing starts to ease. So, and like, I, I'm really from the firm belief that like right now you need to actually be doubling down on your business. Uh, and so if it's slow right now, you should start figuring out what you can do to optimize your business. And if it's actually growing at a very rapid clip, also being super productive during this time, how do you actually figure out how to do more with less? And so that's kind of what my slides are gonna be about is doing more with less and turning things into your advantage, especially if you are, if you do have a leaner team right now or you're working from home. And it's more than more important than ever to actually have a system in place. Uh, I think one of the key things for any entrepreneur or operator that's out there is like being resilient uh, and being persistent, especially in this time. And so I don't think many of us, even on this phone call today, would get to where we are in life as a business or even professionally or personally if it wasn't for the resiliency that we have. So there's three things that I think that you can do right now to either just survive, if you're just looking to just like get by and get through and endure the pain that you're experiencing as a business right now, because I know there's some people that are going through things that are even dialed in on this webinar. And then the others that are thriving that can just be doing things differently. So it's all about how do you do, do, think, do things differently to level up and just accelerate your business from where it is today. So these three levers that I'm going to discuss with everybody uh, is unify, automate, and grow. So it's all about like how can you unify your data, use it so you can act on it. How can you use technology or systems to automate it, automate it, uh, and letting your uh, high value, high impact employees do what they need to do, and letting technology do what it needs to do, so that you're not dealing with repetitive, low value tasks. And then lastly, growing, right? Taking what you've unified and what you've automated, putting that in, putting that together and making magic, right? So you can thrive in the good times and you can also protect you from the downside in the bad times. So firstly, we're gonna talk about unify, unification. So yes, you can play defense in a tough environment, uh, but, there's ways that you can keep playing offense to do better. So here's an example. I'm just gonna give some examples. Um, we just brought on a client that makes a lactation uh, massager for breastfeeding mothers. He's doing great right now. Uh, he's invented it, a really great product. And he, I went to his site and he had all these great bundles. And um, I learned from him because, wait, that's amazing. What, what, why don't I take my, a great stew and combine it with a not a good stew and combine it together and let's just make a quarantine kit. And so there's ways that you can increase your AOV. You can get rid of cash or inventory that is technically cash that's sitting by putting these these products together uh, and getting that sell through and getting that momentum going. So anyway, playing offense, understanding how you can make more profit. Uh, and a lot of that is, I think you can do that through bundling kidding. You can do that through gift cards. I know uh, BigCommerce just launched something with gift cards as well. And also just figuring out how you can promote those kits and bundles. The other piece I think is super important is just being direct to everywhere. And uh, not just, I look at each of these channels as just channels, not as businesses. And so you wanna make sure you're as diversified as possible. So I always say this is like, I look at playing playing Monopoly as e-commerce. You wanna be on every piece of the board to win. And if that means being on many different channels, whether it's Amazon or Walmart or eBay, or maybe it's Sephora, or maybe it's Zola, maybe it's Huckberry, but embracing many different channels along with retail. Um, and interestingly enough, since retail has taken offline retail, brick and mortar has taken such a hit, emphasis has actually moved away from that channel. And maybe now's the time to actually re-emphasize it because if nobody's emphasizing it, 
maybe that's the channel actually you should be looking into right now. If they have downtime and nobody's reaching out to them, now you can be different and do what others aren't doing. Uh, and I, I know Mr. Resnick on the call from Sourceify is going to talk more about this. Uh, I truly do believe that the days of having one warehouse, at least for uh, the majority of us, are over. And you need to have a much stronger footprint to survive. And so for me, I actually look at where people are buying from. And this is all about having that unified data. Look at where people are buying from, what percentage are coming from each state, and analyzing it so you can actually make sure that you're placing your merchandise as close as possible to the customer. And so for example, uh, Nate shared with me a great 3PL that I now use. So it, it comes down to knowing the right people that can give you the right insights that can really move the needle in your business. And so it could be that your factories are shutting down. It could be that China is shutting down. It could be that air freight is too expensive. Maybe you want to fulfill from somewhere else. All these things right now are coming up for a lot of us that are on the call, and hopefully we'll be able to answer a lot of these in Q&A. And of course, hopefully Nate will be able to answer them in his session. But all of this is coming up, and so you just have to think differently and adapt to the times, or else you're going to be left behind. Uh, one example I wanted to just give a shout out to that's really thriving and and actually more than thriving in this environment, accelerated during the pandemic is Tushy. They are a D2C bidet company. And so they're a customer of ours. Uh, the CEO is uh, actually, I, I consider him a friend at this point, uh, but they've been able to unify their data and identify uh, what's been fast selling and also understand how to use our system so they can leverage how to ship much faster into the US since they actually ran out of stock so quickly. You know, there was a run on toilet paper. Well, when there's no toilet paper, people start getting strategic and looking into bidets. And I actually think that bidets are a much more civilized way to, to do it. So they were able to route those orders that, that were out of stock. They came in from virtual warehouses that were able to be fulfilled from overseas, direct to consumer, and they just thrive during peak demand. It's been pretty, pretty unbelievable to watch along with just making their customers super happy. All right, so the next next section I want to talk about, the next lever, is really automation. So for me, it comes down to how can you actually do more with less with a leaner team uh, and use technology to become an outsized team where you're looking at a much better ratio of revenue to, to employee. Uh, and so that's that's a key metric that I always talk to with other individuals that are in the e-commerce space. It's like, how many employees do you have? Oh, the the more employees, the better. Well, that's not always how I look at it, right? It's a good cocktail party question. But for me, if you can do more with less and you can still put more money back into your pockets or back into your employees' pockets uh, and allow them to do higher value activities, why not? So it's putting back time into your own hands and time back into your employees' hands. So it's all about, for me, it's about being nimble and how to and how you can use technology to automate a lot of the mundane. And so finding technology, again, it's, it's, it's so hard to talk about automation because essentially I used to have a 30 person company on the e-commerce side. And now I have one person at my e-commerce company using technology to drive it forward. And so at least during this time, just changing the way you're thinking, seeing how you can lean out your cost structure and identifying like what tasks need to be automated. And one of the ways to do that is to really look at where you spend your time today, doing a audit of like, do I have a bucket list and do I have an effort list? And looking at those two lists and figuring out what do you hate doing and how can you identify what technologies you can utilize or individuals, but hopefully technologies to automate those low value tasks you're spending time and time is money. And also, by the way, it's subject to human error. So how can you find technology to just automate these things that people just spend hours and hours doing? Um, so, and that goes back to, again, lowering your overhead. Uh, so like at, for example, at Subana, like we, had, we identified someone in the company who was really into understanding what's happening in COVID and they became a resource for us, almost like a coach to say, like, hey, here's how we should be navigating it. This is what other companies are doing. This is what we shouldn't be doing anymore. Uh, this is what we should be changing. Uh, and it really moved the needle for our company tremendously. And part of that is just like overhead in general. How can you essentially have automation automatically setting up for yourself to do the rate shopping, to do bundle breakdowns, to fulfill if you have multi multiple different warehouses? 
Uh, next up is essentially your accounting, right? So if you have an accounting team in-house or maybe you have an off outsource team, we're, we're not in the staff or placement business, but we're in the staff augmentation business. And bookkeepers, it's all about driving hourly uh, dollars for overhead expense for your own company to do your books. And so how can you use technology? So Stubana just released a QuickBooks connector that essentially uh, allows uh, you to not replace your bookkeeper, but augment them so they don't have to do those low value tasks and charge you 100 or $150 an hour. So we'll be able to streamline and transfer all your revenue data, all your fees, all your expenses, everything you need into QBO, QuickBooks Online, for accurate reporting and reconciliation. It's pretty much a game changer. Uh, so reach out if you have questions about it, happy to help. The other piece is just like making sure that you're delighting customers and that's making sure that you're not running out of stock. And if you run out of stock, whether it's people are coming to your site and there's a visitor and they don't buy, it affects your conversion rate, whether they come to Amazon and they don't buy and they see that you're not prime eligible, uh, you're not gonna have a good bestseller rank, you're gonna drop from page one. If you're not on page one, you're not relevant. Bingo, bingo, bongo. So how do you prevent that from happening? Well, you need to have the right process or system in place. Spreadsheets are not going to cut it. And too often do I hear people rely on spreadsheets to forecast and demand plan, and that is literally just not the way to win in this environment. And uh, I always want to give a shout out to a great team in Death Wish Coffee. They got their big break after winning the Super Bowl, uh, and they just started selling out. So they came on Subana and they essentially started automating their entire operational processes and they have multiple different fulfillment centers now, different roasters, all these moving parts, so multi-SKU, multi-fulfillment, multi-warehouse that are now integrated and unified into Stubana. Um, and this is a quote from the founder uh, who also, I, I consider people that are coming to Stubana, especially people that I've been working with for years, family. And he's, he joined the Stubana family uh, years ago and, and hasn't left. And uh, they haven't oversold one item since coming on, but essentially it's all about how can you delight your customers? That's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. And then lastly, uh, you have grow. So the last lever to pull here is how do you take and power and take your unified information that you have, take your automation, sort of mix that together and create magic and grow. And when I talk about grow, it's growing in many different ways, right? Maybe you're automating your business so you can grow from a personal level and you can do more, spend more time with your, with your son or your daughter or your family or your significant other. Uh, and so here you're looking at powerful combinations are creating magic where you can actually now try to figure out what do you need to liquidate? What do you need to be buying more? Like, is anybody, I'm curious on the call, if people are looking at uh, maybe in the past 30 days, what hasn't sold or in the past week, what hasn't sold? That's the kind of insight that you need to figure out and doing that performance uh, valuation on your inventory to sort of realize actual cash from your inventory and redeploy that back into the business for a positive ROI. Uh, you've got growing with the right SKUs. So understanding how to replenish based on rules in the system. So basing, base, basically, instead of using spreadsheets, how do you essentially have a technology work for you on a, as a 24-7 employee to essentially create a purchase order for you awaiting authorization? Or analyzing the lifetime value of your customers, not just overall, but looking at Shopify, what's your LTV? How many were one-time buyers versus two-time buyers versus eight-time buyers? And what percentage of those purchases are coming for those from those individuals? And how can you remarket to those individuals and open back up their wallet, right? Doubling down on the customers that essentially have already paid you money, they've put in your credit card, is that much easier to capture more dollar share from those customers than going out to find a new customer. And if you look at someone like Nomad, again, Friends of mine also happen to be in the Stubana fam, but this company essentially came to us with serious problems of overstocking, didn't have a holistic view of where they were making money, where they were losing money on a stew by stew level. And we came in to help them and we've been partnered ever since. And so while I realize, and we'll talk more about this in Q&A hopefully, like not all journeys are beautiful. Um, I'm reading a great book right now, and this actually this image on the left-hand side is called The Messy Middle. And so when people start a company, they're so enthusiastic, then they realize it's really, really hard. And then they work really, really hard at it. And then suddenly 
they're on, they're reaching great momentum, but there's all these things that happen in the middle of that timeline uh, that they have to endure. Painful, painful moments that many operators and e-commerce operators, even maybe right now, are going through. So these are uh, it's kind of a crazy time, and I'm not saying it's it's so pretty and so easy, but what I'm trying to recap here is how do you take a smaller team and how do you make an outsized impact and dominate uh, in a time where it's turbulent? So unifying your data in one place, in my opinion, figuring out how to optimize your life and your time, where you spend your time that you shouldn't, automating the heck out of it, and then putting that together so you can actually grow the business uh, on the defense, but also putting you ready for the offense when things do pick up post COVID and post Floyd issues that are happening in the world right now. So uh, the last piece I just want to share, and I've, I've, I've mentioned a few of our customers on the line, is that you can always feel free to reach out. Uh, my personal email is right here on the screen. It's chat at Stubana. Don't be afraid to reach out and just ask questions. Ask me who my favorite 3PL is or who I recommend. Ask me who I recommend for returns. It's all about your network and how you can learn from other people. And by the way, it's not only me. Uh, like to grow, I'm here to help, but there's a massive community of people that are here to help you grow. And that is in our run D2C community, uh, where it's an invite only community. We bring together others in the e-commerce world that are doing great. And those that have done great are, are, are struggling right now and we help each other win. So if you want to join, you can use this link right here, bit.ly slash slack D2C and go and apply. Uh, and there's a whole community of people that are here to help you. All right, so I think that covers my session. If you have questions, put them in the chat box. I'll be active. I'll, I'll, I'll be responding to questions. And of course, feel free to email me. Thank you so much, Chad. Uh, next, next up, we have Jill from Inventory Planner. Um, Jill's going to talk about forecasting customer demand to optimize inventory so you could avoid missed revenue and make sm smarter decisions about what to buy. So Jill, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Gina. So I'm excited to follow up on Chad's talk because I think that uh, I, was, I was nodding vigorously as he was mentioning several points. Um, so we're going to um, expand on some things that he talked about. Um, Inventory Planner, we're a software system that forecasts customer and demand. We integrate with 30 different platforms, including Skibana, including BigCommerce. Um, so picking up on all that functionality that Chad was talking about, and then really digging into forecasting needs so that we can optimize your inventory, which really means optimize your cash flow, right? Cash flow is the name of the game. Uh, by way of background, I was a merchant for four years. I took over an existing e-commerce company. Um, I was an inventory planner customer for three and a half of those. Um, we went from having absolutely no system, system for ordering or forecasting um, other than walking around in the warehouse and kind of looking around um, and, and really running out of cash. I mean, we were on a downward trajectory. Things were not looking good in terms of cash flow started using demand planning, we're able to turn that around. And then a couple of years ago, we were able to sell our business. So it can really make or break in terms of what's happening with your cash flow and making sure that customers have what they want. So the point of forecasting is making sure customers have what they want, when they want it and where they want it. You know, this speaks to having it in the right warehouse, like Chad was mentioning. Um, and, and the other part of this is not just not missing revenue because you're out of stock, but also identifying that overstock. It is cash sitting on your warehouse shelves. Get it out of there. Put it somewhere else in your business that it's going to perform better for you, whether that's better performing inventory or you're putting it into ads to get new customers. Think about the best place that you're going to get the best ROI for that cash for your business. So uh, let's dig into it. Like, how do you get started with with forecasting. So the first thing to think about is your forecasting method. The, the philosophy behind forecasting demand is thinking about we're using past data to indicate what's going to happen in the future. So we need to think about what is the relevant time period that will indicate what's going to happen in the future. So if I have a really trendy item, I can look at what happened in the last 14 days, 30 days. That will be 
responsive to those customer uh, trends in demand for what's going to happen in the next few weeks. If I have a seasonal item, though, it doesn't matter what happened last month. It matters what happened last year and the year before, because we want to pick up on year over year growth. Uh, we want to make sure that we're hitting those peaks and valleys. So as we're heading into Q4, as an example, then we want to be ramping up and having enough inventory on hand to meet the demand that we know is coming at that time. Uh, we can also think about items with a short sales history. You know, maybe it's um, something that belongs to a category that would sell well in the summer, but we, we haven't had that item for a long time, so we don't know that it would perform well in the summer. Well, we can tie it to the category and say, we know how this should perform with similar items. So think about that forecasting method. What is the relevant period of time for data so that we're computing that sales rate correctly? The next thing to think about is sales when you are in stock. So we need to keep in mind when we've been in stock and out of stock because we're really trying to get at how much do customers buy when we have something available. So let's take an example. If we sold 30 items last month, we have a sales velocity of roughly uh, one unit per day. However, if we were out of stock for half the month, truly the rate that customers purchased when it was available is two units per day. So you can see how it makes a huge difference to take into account when you're in stock and out of stock. If we're not taking that into account, we're gonna be under forecasting, you run out of stock again, and you're just repeating the cycle over and over again, missing out on revenue every single time. Bad news, so let's avoid that. So the, the underlying point here is to think about what is our sales velocity? What is the rate of sales? So sometimes I talk to people who are talking about a reorder point. You know, Maybe when I get to 20 units, that's when I reorder. The, the bad part about a static number like that is that as your demand for that item grows, as your store grows, 20 units isn't gonna be relevant anymore. It's something you have to come back to and spend time on and maintain that number. Uh, so think about rate of sales. So if I'm selling two units per day and I wanna cover a period of 30 days, I'm thinking about the rate of sales um, as it applies moving forward. So, so just keep that in mind. All right, uh, so now that we've talked about forecasting demand, what do we do with it? Creating that purchase order. So there's a, there's a lot of data, this can really be an overwhelming step. And just in case you don't have all the cash in the world and you need to make some choices about what to order, uh, let's talk through a few different metrics to pay attention to. So one of these is forecast lost profit. I think this really gets to the opportunity cost of if you don't act now to order, you run out of stock and miss out on this profit for your company. OK, so I think that really distills what is the cost of not acting now versus placing that order, getting inventory in stock so that you have it when your customers want it. Um, another metric that you can think about is um, so you figured out the demand, you figured out what that replenishment quantity is. Multiply that by your profit. Ideally, if you don't have that handy, then multiply it by your um, retail value. So that can get a sense of, is this going to result in a lot of revenue for my company or just a little bit? If it's just a little bit, maybe that's something I can wait on um, until we have the cash to replenish that item or look at discontinuing that item. So um, that's, that's one way to think about prioritizing stock for replenishment. The flip side of that is the overstock. So like I said, cash sitting on your shelves, um, how do we get it out of here? So maybe we've forecasted demand, we've got one month of overstock. Okay, not great, but let's compare it to other items that might be overstocked for 18 months, uh, 12 months, something like this. High priority, get it out of there. How do we get some cash? I think the bundling idea that Chad mentioned you know, pairing it with um, a high performing SKU is a great idea for getting items out of there. Um, you can even look at quantity bundles depending on your product for that item. You know, maybe you can move out five at a time, 10 at a time um, for slightly lower cost per item. However, think about your shipping costs that if you're shipping out 10 units to one customer, that's lower shipping costs than 10 individual units to 10 individual customers. All right, so think about the bundling. I think there's a lot that can be done there. It's a, it's a really great idea to explore. 
All right. Um, one last idea on prioritization. Um, you know, we, we've all uh, kind of heard of the 80-20 rule. There, there's this idea of ABC classes in inventory. So our A class items are our top 80% of performers. They, they generate the first 80% of our revenue. Um, that's one way you can kind of triage your best performers, your highest priority for replenishment. Uh, we get down to B class as our next 15%, and then C class as our final 5%. Those are our poorest performers. Those can be items that you um, occasionally are okay with being out of stock, you know, due to cash flow issues, or maybe you discontinue them. You really need to think about um, what is the cost of replenishing this, not just in terms of dollars spent with my vendor, but the time it takes to tend to these items, to store them in my warehouse. Is it worth it? Maybe think about discontinuing those items and tightening up your product catalog. All right, so what does all of this mean? We've talked about cash flow a lot. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, the, the result for the company that I was running was we were able to improve our stock turn by eight times, which means um, the time between getting inventory in the door and getting it out the door to our customers improved by 8x. So you can imagine that our cash flow situation improved dramatically between when we had no system and then demand planning to figure out what customers wanted. Um, another merchant that we've worked with really was looking at, okay, how much cash overall do we have tied up in our inventory? You know, it, it, whether it's moving fast or slow, it's all you know cash that we have in our warehouse. So basically they went to a new system of ordering smaller amounts more frequently. Um, they have a trendy item, and so that allowed them to be much more responsive. They weren't as locked into these big orders that then were meant to last them a long time. The result was in six weeks, they were able to reduce their stock value by $1.5 million. I don't know about where you're sitting, where I'm sitting. If I have another million and a half dollars that's now liquid that wasn't before, that's a really big deal in six weeks. So, you know, just being really aggressive about thinking about, what inventory is working for me in terms of turning around that investment as fast as possible and getting rid of the ones that aren't. Um, so that's that's what forecasting can do. Um, inventory planner as a system, like I said, we integrate with other platforms. So we're bringing in your sales information, your product information, um, and we're gonna calculate all of these metrics automatically so we can help identify what is our forecast loss profit? Where am I overstocked? What do I need to order? <clears throat> then we create that purchase order, sync it over to your Skubana account as an example, um, and then you're managing your stock appropriately, like Chad was talking about, not overselling, making sure that you have that all um, in stock as you need to. So um, just really streamlining that process, saving you time, saving you money, um, and really leveling up uh, your operations. So that's a quick look at how to get started uh, with forecasting. And uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the call then. Thank you so much, Jill. That was great. Um, up next, we have Nathan from Sourceify. He's gonna talk about growing your manufacturing network beyond China to decrease supply chain risks and offset vendor disruption. So Nathan, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Gina and Chad, and really appreciate everyone tuning in today. Uh, it's a crazy time in the world and, you know, so much going on. So I'm really excited to touch base on what we're seeing in the supply chain. Um, what I'm really going to be diving into today is how to diversify uh, your supply chain outside of China. I would assume most people tuning in are probably, you know, manufacturing primarily in China. Um, and so today we're going to touch base on how to, you know, really get out of China. A bit about me before I start. Um, in the past 10 years, I've brought hundreds of different products to market. I've ran six-figure e-commerce brands myself. Um, one of my favorite ones is where I invented the first leather watch strap without holes. It worked like a zip tie, like a belt buckle. Um, I've raised over a million dollars on Kickstarter, and I used to live in China uh, in high school, actually, as a foreign exchange student. Uh, and so I speak fluent Mandarin, and I now run Sourceify, and we help you know, Fortune 1000s and high-growth e-commerce brands manufacture products. Uh, around the world. So what we're going to touch on today is, you know, first and foremost, countries to consider for production, um, what to look out for in each country, the current status of production in each country, especially with what's going on in, with COVID-19, um, and then where and how to actually find 
these factories in each country. So a lot of people ask me, you know, why they should diversify their supply chain. Um, you know, right off the bat, it's about de-risking. You know, how many people saw what happened in China in February? Like literally China was shut in February because COVID-19. I mean, we didn't get anything out of China. It was uh, a crazy time. Uh, you know, people usually, of course, forecast Chinese New Year. But, you know, with the uh, extended closure, it caused a lot of problems and people running out of inventory uh, because they were, you know, solely based in China. So first and foremost, you know, you want to diversify to de-risk your supply chain. Secondly, um, when it comes to production, you actually really want to focus your manufacturing hubs around those native production environments. So you know, if you're thinking about like handcrafted goods, India has a lot of these nice arts and crafts products um, that are really special to that country. Uh, and you also want to mitigate your raw material reliance. So, you know, a lot of the world's raw material comes from China, but there are capabilities in Vietnam and India and Pakistan, um, especially leather in Pakistan. We do a decent amount of sporting goods out of Pakistan. Um, so it's something to consider. When it comes to challenges diversifying outside of China, the biggest question that we really see is how to find a factory outside of China. I mean, there are, there isn't a platform like, you know, Alibaba necessarily for Vietnam or India or Pakistan. Um, and though there are some factories that are listed on Alibaba that aren't based in China, you know, there's still uh, primarily Chinese factories on Alibaba. So another component you have to really, you know, look at is managerial overhead. You know, if you're primarily working with China and then all of a sudden you're working with Vietnam and India as well, there can be a lot of complications with communication as well as culture differences uh, and quality fade risk. So if you're trying to produce the same product in China as well as in, in Vietnam, you know, oftentimes you're going to see quality differences between those two factories. And so as you diversify your production, that's going to be, you know, really important to look at. Countries we'll discuss today, America, um, I think right now, it's a really interesting time, you know, for consumers in, in terms of their spending habits and how they're really looking at where products are produced in the world. Um, because a lot of consumers now, they really want to buy products that are made in America. It is, you know, more expensive for the most part to produce products here domestically. Um, but at the same time, if your brand and if your products resonate with those that really want to purchase products in America, it's worthwhile to look at. We're also going to dive into Vietnam, India, and Pakistan. Um, so America, you know, that domestic appeal that we touched on, there's a lot of brands that are really util utilizing this domestic appeal. Um, there are primarily, you know, high manufacturing standards here in the U.S. And it's easy to track, you know, most of the time, a lot of these factories are close by. Um, and you can go visit them. It's cheaper and faster shipping. So when you think about logistics in terms of freight forwarding, it's going to be a lot more affordable to actually you know, manufacture your products from a logistics standpoint in America. IP protection is also top of mind. A lot of people ask when they're, you know, moving production to different countries in Asia, how do I protect my IP in Vietnam or India? Um, and oftentimes what, what we say is that it's protected at the border. You know, you're actually going to protect your IP at the border um, through trademarks and patents in America rather than in those countries. And of course, it's easier to communicate. The main cons, you know, definitely limited production capabilities, uh, higher costs. You know, when you think about your products, the main cost that goes into producing your products are the labor and materials that go into it. Um, and labor rates are, you know, higher here in America than, than overseas. Best products for America, I would say anything that, you know, you ingest, any vitamins or supplements, you know, a lot of supplements are produced uh, here in America. There are some good clothing factories, especially in the garment districts of LA. And then some really good, you know, metal fabrication uh, as well. Most, you know, consumer electronics and footwear and toys are produced overseas. So we aren't really you know, seeing a lot of that here domestically. For Vietnam, I would say what's, you know, really nice right now is there's less restrictions on trade. You know, especially the past two years with the China, China trade wars, there was a, a lot of conflicts, you know, of course, that caused people to diversify production to Vietnam. Labor rates right now have actually gone up a little bit in Vietnam and that's just supply demand uh, factor of labor in Vietnam. You know, Vietnam has about one fourteenth the population of China. Um, so they've got, you know, under hundred million people and China has almost, you know, or has over 1.3 billion people right now. But Vietnam is very strong in cut and sew. So garments, textiles, bags, um, you know, even furniture 
is really strong in Vietnam, but they have re- limited raw material access. So a lot of those factories are actually importing the raw material from China, which can add, you know, to, to lead time as well as, you know, logistic overhead. And then there's fewer factories and typically higher MOQs. The biggest factory I've actually ever been to was a shoe factory that was producing for, you know, major Fortune 500 brands like Clark's. And they had 10,000 people in their factory in Vietnam. It was uh, literally a, a little city. I mean, it was in, an incredible operation to see. Um, so like, you know, I mentioned best products are primarily backpacks, for, for, footwear and some furniture. Um, I wouldn't produce toys there. You know, we had some products that were toy oriented trying to produce in Vietnam. And what you know, we realized is that a lot of those factories don't have the certificates to sell into you know, large retail like Walmart and Target. Uh, from a certificate standpoint. India, you know, it's a rapidly growing economy. The infrastructure there is is definitely in question, um, but it's all based on, you know, uh, raw long-term relationships. And, and India actually, you know, has high quality products if you find the right factories. You know, that's the key here. I think when you diversify production is finding the right factories. Um, but a lot of times there are natural disasters that have cut out power to different factories in India for, you know, long periods of time. Uh, best products, I would say clothing, textiles, rugs, jewelry, all sorts of leather goods. Um, I wouldn't produce you know, any toys or uh, any kids oriented products in India. Pakistan, uh, it's you know a nice developing country. It's got high quality products from a sporting goods standpoint. You know, if you look at where Nike and Adidas produce a lot of their sporting goods, a lot of it's coming out of Pakistan, um, but they have slower logistics and uh, you know oftentimes higher MOQs. But, you know, the best products are definitely, you know, agriculture oriented, machinery and anything to do with, with leather. Um, you know, when you think about sourcing across countries, you know, the key is making sure the infrastructure is there. So if you have to forecast, you know, how your factory is getting raw material to their, actually, to their actual assembly factory, it's a lot of overhead for you. So, you know, you want to rely on the factory in those countries to do that. Um, time zones are always going to be in question. And then just operational overhead of your team. Factory certificates, um, you know, we'll touch on this just briefly, but you know, typically standard certificates are, you know, ISO or BSCI certificates. Um, a lot of these factories too, sometimes you have to, you know, make sure that they have the ability to export. A lot of them are more domestic oriented factories. And so sometimes you're actually gonna have to go through a trading company to work with a local factory uh, in Pakistan or India. Um, just, you know, touching on these certificates, some are quality management oriented, some are environmental oriented. Um, it's nice to see that these factories have that, but it's not always completely necessary. Um, and a lot of, th- a lot of times with these certificates, what will happen is that, you know, they'll go in get inspected. They'll make their factory look perfect for that day of inspection. And then the next day, you know, it won't look the same basically. Um, you know, always make sure that your factory is registered to be able to deal with foreign trade. So, you know, if not, you're gonna have to work with a broker when it comes to exporting uh, products from that factory. And, you know, to find a factory in these countries, you know, America, I'd say some of the best resources are ThomasNet, AmericanManufacturing.org, IndieSource, or Makers Row. Um, India, Vietnam, and Pakistan, you know, you really have to go to trade shows over there. I think that's the best bet, but you know, obviously right now people aren't traveling and a lot of these trade shows are coming online, which is, you know, beneficial for you to be able to, you know, communicate and try to facilitate and build a relationship with these factories in these countries through these uh, online trade shows. So when you manufacture outside of China, um, you know, especially, you know, with the tariffs we saw last year, there was a company we worked with that transitioned furniture production to Vietnam and saved 15% net of their unit costs, which was pretty incredible. Um, We had another company we worked with that was producing fabric in Taiwan and shipping that like special fabric blend to a cut and sew facility in China. And they vertically integrated their cut and sew operation in Vietnam and saved 10% on logistics. And then, you know, company C really wanted to find unique handcrafted items um, for the home goods category and where they'll use Sourceify to do that in India. Um, you know, if anyone has questions about manufacturing, just put it in the chat. I like to you know, answer as many questions as possible. And you know, if you want more information about Sourceify, just go to sourceify.com. Awesome, thank you, Nathan. 
Uh, last up, we have Jean from uh, Shipwire. John's going to talk about diversifying your shipment um, and your fulfillment activities this year, uh, 2020 and beyond. So, John, take it away. Thanks, Gina. Um, I appreciate being invited to participate today. A shout out to Scubana and the Scubana family. My name is Jean Francois. I pronounce it Jean. My mom calls me Jean. Um, I'm the head of strategic partnerships and business development for Shipwire, an e-commerce division of Ingram Micro. Um, I came to Shipwire at first as a customer running a small e-commerce business uh, back in the day, like 2013. Um, and I'm proud to be a part of the team that has done a ton of e-com innovation over the last couple of years. So uh, let's get into this a bit. Um, so over the last couple of months, uh, we should probably set the stage by understanding that over the last couple of months, brands have renewed their interest in diversifying demand. Um, last week, it was my wife's birthday. And normally, I'd be in a mall somewhere trying to find a gift for her. I, I belong to the droves of folks scouring perfectly curated shops uh, to find discretionary goods. But the truth is commercial traffic, foot traffic anyway, is down. Um, and the commercial real estate industry is preparing for what is forecasted to be the biggest slump in decades. Um, these are all signs of a slowing economy, but digital traffic, foot traffic rather, is up by a significant amount. And I think Chad definitely referenced this in his first couple of slides, but uh, the US Commerce Department kind of did a research study and saw that uh, as a percentage of overall e um e-commerce has spiked. In 2009, e-commerce as a percentage of overall sales represented about 5%. And in 2019, e-commerce sales as a percentage of overall retail was 16%. That's a growth of about 11% over 10 years. Um, in the period of eight weeks, uh, after the COVID kind of crisis started, e-commerce sales as a percentage of overall retail hit about 27% um, from 16%, delineating an 11% jump over eight weeks. So if you compare that eight weeks versus that 10 year gap, it's it's really astounding at how fast, uh, as Chad mentioned, you know, the 200 billion is transitioning over to e-com. Um, that's kind of crazy. And I think that, you know, we need to take a look at how how brands have traditionally gone to market. So before we get get ahead of ourselves, let's set the stage by understanding what happened in like 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, I was starting to work for Shipwire, and this is when the biggest CPGs, you know, we're talking about hundreds of millions to billions of dollars in revenue were coming to us because they were hearing that uh, retailers like Macy's were going to be phasing down the amount of inventory purchased through bulk purchase orders um, and instead switching over to a dropship model in order to basically be more cash efficient. Um, these brands were faced with a unique challenge, and that challenge was they were quite incapable of pivoting to this dropship model. And that's for a couple of reasons, right? The first is they operated in, in legacy systems, essentially, that could not differentiate individual SKUs and individual units, rather, um, or eaches versus pallets at the order management level or the front end level, right? And on the inventory side as well. Um, they also had no process flows, workflows, or physical infrastructure at the warehouse level to allow them to support direct to consumer very well. Um, this was around 2015 when drop shipping was still being defined. <clears throat> fast forward to today, um, fast forward to today, over the last few months, we've seen that e-commerce growth has accelerated. Gene, I think your microphone just dropped off. Oh, sorry about that. You're back. You're back. Okay, perfect. Before we uh, talk about how brands can take advantage of these types of opportunities, I think it's time to talk about some of the gaps that traditional um, go to market really has, right? So, uh, some of these gaps are um, largely depend, like businesses that largely depend on purchase orders 
we're talking about like national brands to drive revenue have seen firsthand how they have been sidelined in the past couple of weeks, right? A couple of months. And beyond the intricacies of like seasonality uh, and by any given category, the fact remains that if you're relying very heavily on any one distribution channel to reach your customers, your brand is definitely at risk, right? Um, over time, we've seen three types of use cases. And uh, the first is digitally native brands. These are brands that primarily leverage their owned e-commerce channel to reach customers. Um, and, and, and that's online, right? Um, for these types of brands, brand equity is definitely important to them. Owning customer data is important to them. Um, customizing the customer experience is important to them. For these reasons, they've been hesitant to diversify kind of their sales channels, right? Some of them. Um, and, and we've seen reports over the past few weeks and, and us at Shipwire, we've, we've known for a long time that Amazon has been kind of leveraging that data that they have on customer transactions to build competing products. And for a com combination of these reasons, dig some digitally native brands that, that, that really love control over their brand have hesitated to diversify their sales channel, especially with Amazon. Um, the second group are national brands that have massive distribution um, and capital efficiencies are certainly important to them because capital efficiencies drive revenue. Um, and from massive purchase orders and CapEx on infrastructure side, uh, these teams generally don't have the resources or the in-house experience to support an agile direct-to-consumer operation, right? Um, the third group is what I call Amazon only, and they are either groups that are digitally native brands that only sell on Amazon as a secondary channel or national brands or small businesses that only sell on Amazon as their digital channel. Um, and, and, and as well as entrepreneurs that have businesses that are solely on Amazon, right? For these individuals, idiosyncratic risk um, is definitely inherent and SLAs for Amazon has slowed since COVID and FBA seems to be operating at a lower level, especially for multi-channel, and it's time to probably establish new touch points with the customers. So you can acquire more customers um, and have more ways to get to market. That's the number one reason to diversify your demand channels, right? Um, it's an obvious reason, right? Since 2020, in 2020, there are more touch points that you can have with your customer and therefore more opportunities to tell your story. Why not take advantage of retailers and marketplaces and their customer acquisition mechanisms, their demand uh, channels, right? Um, branded e-com uh, goes without saying that branded e-com is, is the primary touch point for your brand to, to reach out to customers. It's an opportunity to set the tone for your customer experience. Um, brands like Bulletproof, brands like Glossier and others have capitalized on the owned e-com channel uh, as one that sets the tone for all other channels uh, from a customer experience perspective. And this is important uh, as depending on the product mix and product distribution network, this particular channel might be your most profitable. Um, but we've seen use cases where brands can be crushed by the weight of their own success as, uh, for example, the cost of customer acquisition goes up. Um, and what's helpful with that is to diversify on retail.com and marketplace because your cost of customer acquisition across channels goes down the more you diversify. Um, so no matter what, no matter how you mix up your channels, whether it's marketplace, whether it's drop shipping on behalf of a retailer or sending inventory into a direct uh, distribution center, you need to have a playbook and a system stack that allows you to switch back and forth uh, depending on how you fulfill your orders, right? And a good example of this is kind of like when you sell, for example, um, you're drop shipping for major retailers, right? And the holiday season comes and they all of a sudden want to bulk buy some of your fast moving, moving SKUs. Um, obviously for capital efficiencies in, in Q4, you wanna consolidate the amount of inventory you have so that you're not sending four or five boxes to the same household, right? Um, a good example of this also is when you're sending uh, inventory into Amazon as 1P versus, you know, doing seller fulfilled prime or fulfilled by merchant, right? You, those require inherently two different systems of operations 
um, from a warehouse perspective, uh, palletizing goods versus sending them as eaches, right? <clears throat> so in the next slide, we're gonna uh, kind of focus on what it is to have what's called a fault tolerant uh, network design and selling across multiple channels kind of puts you in a position where you need to have inventory in multiple locations um, beyond having customized business rules and systems to adhere to the unique SLAs of your trading partners. Leveraging a multinodal like fulfillment network helps provide layers of inventory to prevent total outages in the uh, event of a demand spike, right? And that's very, very obvious in today's world where, you know, you can see that. Uh, and I think, you know, we've talked about this a bit so far on this on this call today, but you can see that over the last couple of months, the spike in demand has depleted inventory stores in the US. So for the purposes of staging and fulfillment, it's good to have a distributed fulfillment network. Um, other advantages of having multiple nodes for fulfillment is obvious. Uh, it might, might not seem obvious, but it is obvious is, is, is lowering shipping costs, right? The more inventory you have next to the customer, the shorter the time is to send to the customer, but it's also cheaper to ship to the customer. So having multiple nodes across um, multiple geographies, if you're selling in multiple geographies, helps alleviate that stress. Um, and from a shipwire perspective, I think I've talked a bunch about shipwire today, but from a shipwire perspective, this has been a really, really, since the day we were born, essentially, this has been a effective strategy, right? Um, we were the first to kind of have a distributed network of fulfillment uh, warehouses globally to reduce costs. And now I think with our new phase of growth with our Shipwire Partner Plus program, we're actually partnering with 3PLs in the US, in the UK, in Australia, in China, to actually leverage their systems and connect them directly to customers through the Shipwire platform. Uh, this year on Roadmap, we have about 12 more 3PLs we're bringing online to increase that distribution. Um, if you are fast, if you are a fast growing branded manufacturer this is obviously something that your operations team is probably looking into especially when you're shipping um, in multiple geographies so uh and i think as a parting thought the three strategies that i think from an operations perspective that will help brands scale um, are going to be variety redundancy and the last is probably going to be financial stability i think right now a lot of brands are seeing that their providers, not just their fulfillment providers, but some of their even SaaS providers are failing from a financial perspective, whether it's expanding into new facilities, uh, trying to get new racking, um, financial stability from a 3PL perspective is definitely quite important, but also for all the other vendors in your operations stack, um, you have to vet them out from a financial st financial stability perspective in order to make sure that they can last as long as you do. Um, and that's that's pretty much all I have for you today. I think um, for, for me, uh, if you are looking to take a look at your operation stack and you'd like to audit your fulfillment and network design strategy, um, my email is on the screen. You could also reach out on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm always available. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, team. Thank you, Gene. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to do a quick Q&A round. Um, I know a lot of you guys have already asked questions in the questions tab. Uh, be sure to do that now as well if you've been holding back. Uh, first question, we're actually going to talk a little bit about bundling. Um, Chad, I think you, you put a response here, but um, you know, wh where does bundling actually take place in the warehouse? Or is it something that you do um, as a back end functionality? Um, so Chad? Yep, so to quickly zoom out, bundling, kidding, it's one way that I increase my average order value, increase the, the basket size on checkout, uh, and also just explode our SKU counts so that people don't have to choose between Coke or Pepsi, they can sort of have it all uh, in one bundle. Uh, when they click checkout. So there's two ways you can do it. You can create what we call virtual bundles or kits. A virtual bundle means you create this bundle on a, a platform, an e-commerce platform or on Amazon or on any of your channels. And based on that listing, 
you can use a software to break down that bundle into the core components. That's one approach. The other approach is you can leverage a 3PL or your own in-house fulfillment center, uh, and you can like Shipwire for as a 3PL, for example, and you can essentially uh, pre-assemble those core components into the kit or the bundle that you want. So there's two approaches. Um, I like to test, put my, my toes in the water to see if they're warm first. And I like to just create those bundles on the fly virtually. Uh, and then as they sell well, then I'll actually pre-assemble them either on the warehouse level or on the factory level. Great, thank you. Um, also, while we have you on, Chad, uh, does Scubana have any limitations for international companies with fulfillment located inside different countries? That's from Deborah. Yeah, so you can create using our order bots, uh, you can order orchestrate different fulfillment centers based on location and ba based on a whole bunch of other criteria. Uh, and yeah, you can do that all within Stubana. However, right now we are predominantly focused on US dollars. So when it comes in, the FX is transferred back into the US dollar. Awesome. Um, and then I actually have a question for Jill. Um, Jill uh, from Inventory Planner, what are some of the ways to manage inventory when it's spread across different warehouses? So playing off of uh, the past question, whether or not you have um, inventory domestically or internationally, what's the best way to manage that? Yeah, so a couple components to this. One, keep in mind that each warehouse or location is going to have its own personality in terms of forecasting demand, whether that's online or offline, it's East Coast, West Coast, it's selling Amazon Canada versus Amazon US. Um, you're gonna have different demands for each one of those. So calculate forecast individually for each location. Um, then once you have the demand, think about um, comparing the stock, comparing the demand between those two so that you can optimize your inventory. So there's no need to keep buying inventory from your supplier. If you already own it, it's a matter of uh, shifting that, especially domestically, um, it could be worth it. Definitely keep in mind shipping costs there. Um, but I, I think the first thing is, is to look at drilling down on that demand so you know it for that location and then optimizing to see what stock you already own and where it would be best uh, positioned. Great, and also, uh piggybacking off of the bundles question that we uh, just asked Chad, how mm -hmm. can you figure out how much to order when you have one product that sells on its own, but that's also part of a kit? Yeah, definitely. So um, inventory planner can handle bundle configurations. So if you have one component or raw good that goes into several different bundles, um, if it's a component, it could even be sold on its own. You need to know the total demand. Um, so definitely keep in mind those bundle configurations. We'll bring that in from your connected platform automatically. So there's not, you know, double the setup or anything like that. Um, and then the two types of um, setup for bundles that Chad just talked through, whether it's a virtual bundle that's basically bundled uh, on fulfillment, or if it's something that's pre-assembled, um, that'll have a big effect on the demand planning too, because we're looking at your stock um, in different ways. So um, in terms of bundling, yes, definitely take a look at how does the, the demand for the final good translate to all of its components um, so that you're ordering enough to cover everything. Great. Um, and uh, Nathan, this one's for you. Um, how, what's the best way to find factories in Vietnam? Um, I guess yeah, you have an I mean, attendee that's exploring that. Yeah, I was. You know, in Vietnam, um, there's some resources online, you know, some of the marketplaces like uh, Global Sources and Alibaba have, uh, you know, offices there. So they're trying to get more factories online. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think in Vietnam and outside of China, your best bet is to work with, you know, a sourcing agent or a platform like Sourceify. Awesome. And um, Jean, one last question. Uh, this is about 3PLs. Uh, we have an attendee who is branching off to D2C soon, um, but primarily using Amazon. He's not mm -hmm. sure if he should keep fulfilling via FBA um, or move to a single 3PL. He wants to maintain his Prime badge and um, sell a fulfilled Prime. Uh, that's a great question. And I think that uh, it's, there's no way to generally answer questions like this because there's obvious 
there's there are things that are obviously uh, subjective, right? So your SKU count, your SKU mix, where you're trying to sell. Um, I wouldn't recommend just pulling everything out of FBA, obviously, because if your prime badge is important to you and you don't have seller fulfilled prime, it's going to take a while to build up to that. Obvious. Another obvious thing is if you're if you're if you're diversifying the amount of three PLs you have, you never want to make <laughs> dramatic changes there. You want to slowly change. So even if you end up in a situation where you have seller fulfilled prime, you want to transition that uh, that out to a three PL as opposed to just switching it off. Right? That makes a lot more sense. That does. Mm -hmm. Thank thank you so much, Gene. And um, I think that's all the time we have for questions. We're about seven minutes over the hour. I want to thank all of the speakers for joining me today. Tomorrow we have part two of this session, which you will be automatically registered for if you registered for the first session. Um, and you'll be able to tune, tune in tomorrow at 2 p.m. same time. The recording for this webinar will be available using the same login. Um, and actually it should start shortly after I end the webinar. So thank you everyone for joining and um, stay safe. Goodbye. Hi everyone and welcome to day two of the ultimate D2C operation stack webinar. Uh, we have a great speaker lined up today, um, kicking off a lot of what we spoke about yesterday um, and going deeper into your operations platform, your returns, your analytics, and um, your shipping solutions at checkout to drive higher conversion rates. So first I'm gonna go over a few webinar logistics. If you joined us yesterday, you know the drill. First up, questions, Answer, ask them in the questions tab. Uh, we will be monitoring the questions tab throughout the webinar. Um, and if we can't get to your question immediately, we will answer it at the end. Uh, polls, each session has its own designated poll. Um, I'll make an announcement in the chat room that a poll is live. Um, you can go ahead, answer it, see the live result, and it'll be available in real time throughout the session. Um, lastly, resources. Some of the partners decided to share some helpful resources uh, based on their presentations. You'll also find those in the chat tab. So today we have four speakers. Uh, Sashin kicking off the presentation from Big Commerce. We have Jared Smith from Shipper HQ, Stephanie from Happy, Happy Returns, and Chris Little from PayHelm. So here are some of the things we're gonna cover. We'll talk about lowering cost of ownership with a flexible open SaaS platform, leveraging shipping to increase revenue and, and customer confidence, especially at the checkout, reducing the cost of returns and building stronger relationships and of course, unlocking data and watching your business thrive. So without further ado, our first speaker, Sashin from Big Commerce. Sashin, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Gina. Hello, everyone. My name is Sashin Mudhawan. I'm the Senior Director of Technology Partnerships here at Big Commerce. I'm very grateful and thank you, Skubana, for hosting um, Big Commerce at this, at this virtual summit. Very excited to, to present the content. Um, this topic is very relevant, very timely, and and uh, uh, you know perfect timing in terms of what a lot of businesses are going through the change. Um, I wanted to give a quick background before we go into the the content itself. It's I joined Big Commerce about four and a half years ago as uh, the leader of our sales engineering organization. And what sales engineering really is is technical folks that work um, the sales opportunities. So. I firsthand got to experience with many brands, many merchants, many businesses that were evaluating uh, their e-commerce platform. So I got to firsthand listen to the requirements, the objections, the concerns, and I really wanna bring some of that experience into this conversation on um, really on this specific topic of um, total cost of ownership. So what, the piece of the puzzle of the operation stack that, that I'm presenting on is really thinking through the cost of ownership on a, a flexible and open SaaS e-commerce platform. And, and I'm gonna be talking about that. So um, I'll highlight some of the big commerce or e-commerce overview. So for any uh, audience members that are new to e-commerce, just a little bit on uh, e-commerce platforms. 
We'll talk about e-commerce benefits, um, especially focusing on total cost of ownership. And then I'll share three examples of customers that probably went through the same questions that you all have and, uh, and why they selected the commerce. So I know Chad covered this um, kind of trend, uh, uh, some of these trends yesterday as well. I wanted to provide perspective from a, a big commerce point of view. So some of you may know we have over 60,000 merchants on our platform. So we have these really interesting insights and we've been observing and sharing these insights with the broader community around what trends we are seeing pre-COVID and, and post-COVID or pre-COVID and now week over week, right? So we share these trends to what we are observing through our platform. So similar to what Chad presented, right? There are some categories here that you would recognize and, and um, acknowledge that, you know, that, that, are, that are seeing high growth. And there are categories that are, that are suffering, right? And, and as we open up the markets, right, some of that balance um, will, will change again. Uh, but uh, sporting goods, health and beauty, apparel and accessories are the categories that are, that are really uh, have taken off in terms of year over year growth. What I want to highlight here, though, is um, acknowledging that many businesses that had e-commerce already baked into their business growth strategy um, were able to accommodate um, the change better, right? So I've talked to businesses that their uh, the physical stores shut down and they were able to start marketing or start approaching their consumers through the online online medium, right? They were the, the customers were able to still buy the products through their website versus not having that option, right? So we're certainly seeing this shift in is e-commerce, you know, part of a wish list item or is part of a future strategy versus I think as we come out of COVID and come out of this 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 change, um, e-commerce will become a, a very critical part of your many businesses business growth strategy, right? So certainly an interesting interesting trend that we're observing there. So I've talked about e-commerce technology, right? When you think about um, the technology spectrum, right? There are many players in this, in this market, in this segment, but really the, the two spectrums are on one side, you have open source e-commerce and you have cloud-based e-commerce. There is a, a reality and perception to that open source gives you the most flexibility, most control over the code and the experience. On the other spectrum, you have cloud-based, which has the reality and perception to somewhat restrict it, right? So the businesses have to kind of change their processes to accommodate what the SaaS technology enables them to do. BigCommerce really sits in the middle, and we call ourselves this concept of open SaaS, right? So all open SaaS means is that we're able to offer our customers the SaaS benefits, software as a service benefits, of not having to maintain servers and, and, and upgrades and security patches and all that, while giving the power of openness. And the openness plays in two parts, right? One, openness to integrating with other systems, right? So all the panels that spoke yesterday and they're speaking today have integrations into our platform. So from a merchant standpoint, you have the openness to how your e-commerce platform connects to other systems. And then the second openness is around customizability, right? So especially when we think about D2C, um, you know, you every business is unique. Every business wants to create unique experiences for their consumers, right? So your platform should be easily customizable for you to create that unique experience for your consumers. So our mission is to help merchants sell at sell more at every stage of growth, right? We work a lot with um, large businesses that are brand new to e-commerce. We work with digitally native brands that started with e-commerce. So we are focused on helping them grow on our platform. Now, interestingly, the three value propositions that you see here, the first one is low total cost of ownership, right? That's, that's the most attractive value proposition for merchants as they look at e-commerce platforms. Um, the second one is powerful performance and built for growth. And you'll see when I talk through them, there's the cost benefits and the cost of ownership kind of plays into all three of them. So what is low, low total cost of ownership, right? So three things um, that, that you think about is pricing, right? So what is my cost per order 
from an online e-commerce order, right? Um, how long does it take for me to launch, right? When do I start generating revenue through my online e-commerce? And then what is my ongoing maintenance? Right? How much does it cost in resources and cost in, 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 in um, uh, uh, development effort um, to maintain my e-commerce growth, right? So the first one around um, uh, cost per order, BigCommerce pricing is based on bands, right? So we give our merchants predictability, right? So you may get one BigCommerce price per month for 1,000 orders per month to 5,000 orders per month, right? So as a business, you know that as you're going from growing from 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 to 3,500 orders per month, your cost of e-commerce stays the same, right? Until you hit that band and move into the next band. So that gives you better predictability in forecasting your, your revenue and your cost. The second one is how fast does it take you to launch your store, right? So many for many D2C brands, um, you know, sometimes, in, and if you've experienced this, it can be nine to 12 months or even longer and very heavy investment upfront to actually see that first order transact through your online store, right? With BigCommerce, in mid-market on average, right, we see three months um, of launch. So from, you know, it takes you three months before you're starting to generate uh, orders and, and starting to transact online. And then because it's SaaS, you don't have upgrades, right? There's no version control. Everybody on is on the same version of BigCommerce. There's no security patches. So really there's no cost of ongoing maintenance, which, which falls into the total cost of ownership. The second value proposition is around powerful performance, but it again, going back to the cost, we talked about downtime and uptime, right? So uptime is really, really critical when you think e-commerce because even for a minute that your store is down, that's lost revenue because there may be consumers that at that minute trying to get to your store and they're not able to complete the checkout or even look at the product because the store is down for maintenance, right? So the uptime is really important. And, and, and plays into the, the total cost, cost savings and, and revenue. Um, speed is really important, right? So for any businesses that are new to e-commerce, consumers don't have tolerance for slower experience, right? They would go to the next search result to buy their product somewhere else, right? So either that's speed on web or speed on mobile, right? Consumers don't really care how they're engaging in e-commerce. They don't care if they're on 4G, 3G, Wi-Fi, they want the store experience as fast as they expect, right? So the speed is really important as well. On the build for growth, where the importance of cost comes into play is think about how many employees in your business should contribute to your e-commerce strategy. And, and what I, you know, one example I, I talk about is, do you have a marketing person that is thinking about a brilliant creative idea of coming up with a promotion? Now, how long does it take for that promotion to become reality on your e-commerce store? Do they have to draft up the idea and then somebody in development has to scope it out? Then they have to test it on the platform, right? On some systems, right, that, that idea can take weeks before it becomes reality, right? Being able to, um, to support that on a platform where you have more and more of your employees are empowered to use e-commerce um, because of ease of use, right? And then the second bullet point here is, is, again, reiterating the benefit of having access to best-in-class applications, right? So the panels that you're hearing about today and yesterday, um, really, how can you benefit from um, complementary um, uh, capabilities and functionality that helps you grow your e-commerce uh, online? All right, so those were the value propositions. I, I want to highlight here that um, uh, the, the ability to manage all different types of models of commerce is really important, right? D to C, B to C, B to B, because as, as we see this, as businesses grow, all of these models start to kind of blend together, right? So B to C businesses that are growing, you know, they may want to create a different experience for their wholesalers, right? That doesn't mean you need a different e-commerce platform. That shouldn't mean that you need a different domain or different URL, but your platform should be able to, again, be open so you can customize that experience based on the buyer profile, right? Either that's, you know, some buyers don't, are not um, authorized to see these products or they see different prices or their checkout is, is customized because there are different payment options, right? So your platform should support all of those business models, uh, including B2B as an example. 
So let's look at some of the customers because again, like I said, I think as we are going into this content with total cost of ownership in mind, and I firsthand experienced this as a sales engineer at BigCommerce, um, you know, why that's important, right? So these are three examples of customers, you know, the first one being Skull Candy. Um, you know, they came from a platform where it was a very extensive and expansive platform, probably a lot that they didn't need, but they were paying for that. It was difficult to maintain. And one of the key reasons why they, um, you know, evaluated many e-commerce platforms and selected BigCommerce was total cost of savings, right? And flexibility and the openness of the platform and, and the breadth of, uh, you know, the APIs and, and, and technical um, capabilities, right? They launched their site, and these these numbers may be outdated, but they've seen 25% improvement in add to cart, you know, growth and improvement to conversion. Again, spending less, they're able to grow their business even even um, higher, right? The second example, which I know a lot of us are working, all of us are working from home. So this slide and the example may make you jealous if you don't have a cool standing desk. I don't actually. Um, but Uplift Desk is a really amazing example. And again, they are in that category of having grown tremendously through this COVID um, uh, timeframe. Um, but what's, why I wanted to highlight this is again, reflects the openness of the platform. So if you get a chance and look at upliftdesk.com, you will see how on the SaaS platform, they were able to make it super easy for consumers to design their desk before they buy it, right? So that openness was really important to them. And as you can see, they have seen amazing, tremendous growth um, on, on the platform as well. And the last example is around um, SC Johnson being able to launch quickly, right? We see with e-commerce, and I think this is very relevant to D2C use cases, where e-commerce should enable you to experiment, right? There might be brands that you just want to launch a store with its unique brand and, and see consumer behavior, right? See consumer reaction to how your audience is accepting that brand, how your audience is reacting to, to that brand or to that price, right? E-commerce should make it very easy for you to, at low cost, at fast time to market, be able to experiment with those, right? So um, from an SC Johnson standpoint, right, they were able to um, launch three different three different brands in a, in a very quick, uh, quick turnaround. So those were three examples. Please check them out on their on their sites. Um, as part of this uh, contribution to the virtual summit, um, we are offering three months free on any plan. So you'll get notifications on um, you know links to where you can take advantage of this offer. Again, we are committed to your success, and that's all the content that I wanted to present. And thanks everyone for for listening. My email address is here. Please reach out if you have specific questions and I look forward to seeing any questions that come up through the chat. Thank you so much, Sash. Uh, great presentation. It's it's wonderful to see how much big commerce has grown and the functionality that you guys have gotten over the past couple of years. Um, next up, we actually have Jared Smith um, from Shipper HQ. So Jared, take it away. Thank you so much and, and thanks for having us on. Uh, it's great to, to connect with everybody. Uh, so once again, my name is Jared Smith. I'm the head of sales here at Shipper HQ. And what we're going to be talking about today is everybody's favorite topic, shipping. Now, I, I joke about that, but it is a, a critically important thing to any e-commerce business, as long as you're selling physical goods. And I think it's it's something that most merchants approach in exactly the wrong way. I just see so many merchants that I'm talking to that they, they just look at shipping as, as kind of like a box to check, just a thing to like complete the checkout experience and, and just get on with, with making that sale. And, you know, you're, you're leaving so much opportunity on the table. In some cases, you're, you're absolutely killing your margins. Um, but, you know, merchants, I think, hope that they can at least just break even on shipping which to me is exactly the wrong way to you know approach any any part of your business is you should always be looking at how you can turn any single thing into a profit center or a competitive advantage and so what we're going to be talking about today specifically with regards to shipping is how you can make it a profit center how you can make it drive more revenue for your business now why do you care what we're talking about you know who's shipper hq so we were founded in 2008. We originally launched the brand as web shop apps. And over the past 12 years or so, um, we have built all, you know, several of the most popular shipping applications and extensions across a variety of different platforms. 
Now we had, I think at some point, 40 or 50 different separate applications. In 2014, we decided to combine all that learning and all that robust functionality into a single platform. And so we rebranded and relaunched in 2014 as Shipper HQ. Uh, we've got over a decade of shipping experience. And what we specifically focus on is powering the checkout experience, you know, bringing the enterprise level functionality that you can see some of the brands that we support on the right hand side here, but bringing that to businesses of all sizes. You know, we know that consumer expectations are, are certainly not getting simpler and they're not getting, you know, they're not they're not getting uh, less robust. And so you need a solution that is going to be able to meet those expectations and power the, the types of shipping experiences that, that consumers have just come to expect. Now, what I want to specifically talk about is, you know, this is a question that I get all day, every day is, you know, I'm talking to merchants, we're talking about what their shipping requirements are, but, you know, then we start talking about what their shipping strategy should look like. And they always hit me with the question is, you know, what, what should I do? How many options are the right number of options? What carrier should I be showing? How should I be doing free shipping? And, and the answer to that question is whatever your customers want. And that's a super fun answer that everybody totally loves and appreciates. But it's it's honestly the only true and candid answer is that there is no silver bullet. There is no you know perfect playbook that you can just you know you know apply to every single business. It, it's all unique to the business, the products that you're selling, and most specifically the the customers. You know how do your customers want to receive their packages? And so you know I think the the important thing is not to you know, simply add a single option or here's your silver bullet, just do that. The The important thing is to have flexibility, to try things, to iterate, to, to give different options to your customers so that they can receive the packages on their terms. And so, you know, sometimes that is like providing options before they even know that they're available. You know, one thing that we're seeing proliferating really significantly these days is the ability to receive packages in non-standard ways. So don't just have it shipped to my door, have it shipped to a nearby business so I can pick it up. You know, leverage that brick and mortar uh, footprint to, you know, do a buy online pickup in store. There's so many different options and so many different ways that customers may want to receive their packages that there is no one single answer, but it's important to be flexible. Uh, and I also see all day, every day, customers that just, they don't give too much of a thought about shipping. They think I'm getting rates, I'm good to go, you know, packages are getting sent out the door and suddenly they actually do an audit, you know, a year or two later and realize they're not profitable. You know, they're getting absolutely crushed in their margins on shipping and suddenly they realize that it is important to their business and how do they fix that? Um, and then ultimately, how can you use shipping to drive more sales, better conversions and more money? And so here's a ton of stats. I'll let you read the specific stats, but you know, I think the, the, the most cautionary tale that I can provide is, as far as stats go is that when you're looking at abandoned carts, shipping constitutes over 60% of all abandoned carts. And that could be a variety of different reasons. It could be because shipping costs are too high. It could be because you're not showing the right options. You're showing too many options. You're confusing customers. They don't believe that the shipping costs are legit or they don't know when they're gonna get their package. There's so many different reasons why a customer might get all the way to the end of the checkout where they're getting those shipping rates and then completely bounce off your website and never make a purchase. And so, you know, while that is uh, certainly a cautionary tale, it's also, you can spin it on the other side to be, you know, a really great opportunity. You know, if you can nail your shipping strategy, there is a huge amount of abandoned carts that you can prevent from abandoning in the first place. And so how do we go about doing that? You know, it's all about customer expectations, right? And so, you know, our, our tagline is we deliver on expectations and, you know, it's about understanding what your customers are looking for and then meeting those expectations every single time. And so there are you know, a lot of different ways that you can do that. Calculated delivery dates, you know, that's one thing. I think everybody knows that that is you know, useful and beneficial and, and people try to kind of dip their toe into it and say, you know, I'm gonna give static text. I'm gonna say, you know, this is three to five days to get there. Uh, but that's just not good enough. Customers wanna know the day that they're gonna get it. Sometimes they wanna know the hour they're gonna get it. And sometimes they don't just wanna be told when they're gonna get it. They want to be able to choose that option to receive it on their terms. And so you need to, to have the flexibility to be able to do that, but it also needs to be consistent with your warehouse and your fulfillment processes. So it's not enough to just say, you know, it's gonna get there in three days. Um, what if you're, you know, what if it's a Sunday night? Are you actually shipping out at that moment? Probably not. And so you need to make sure that you're considering the logic around your fulfillment processes in order to make sure that you're not just setting an expectation, but you can actually deliver on it too. 
because you may get that order, but you want you want that repeat business. Once you acquire that customer, you want to keep them and you want to keep them coming back. Um, Sashin talked about a you know a lot of businesses that are, are you know maybe not already in e-commerce and or maybe they have a you know combination a hybrid business that is uh, you know offline and online. Um, and you know we're working with so many businesses today to help go through that digital transformation because suddenly they have to actually start shipping products they were never doing that before. They have a brick and mortar or sort of retail operation that they've been doing for years. Now they're trying to go online. And so in some cases right now, that, that feels like a little bit of a liability, but again, it can be an opportunity. You know, if you have a store location or maybe even ex an expansive footprint of different brick and mortar locations, that is a huge asset that you should be leveraging because sure, some customers do want to receive a package, but maybe other ones want to have it like swing by when they're out and out doing things and just pick it up conveniently themselves. You know, you can take this seeming liability and actually turn it into a, an asset and a huge competitive advantage. So if you do have a physical store or a physical presence and you're competing against these pure play e-commerce businesses, that's something that you absolutely want to highlight. But again, you need to make sure that you're communicating that information to customers in a clear and concise way at checkout. Um, you know, like I said, consumer expectations are not getting easier. You know, we went from two day shipping being the de facto standard. Now it's next day and, you know, it will very soon become same day, if not hourly delivery. And so you need a way that you can translate all these different options in a, a seamless and convenient way at checkout. Um, you know, th these services aren't appropriate for all businesses. You know, especially in the B2B space, sometimes we're looking at like long purchase order processes. And so same day delivery doesn't make sense. Other businesses, when you're looking at like fast moving consumer goods, it's absolutely critical and maybe the, the difference between making a sale or not. Ultimately, it's about trying things out, seeing what your customers are looking for, uh, giving them options, seeing if they take advantage of those options and then building upon that strategy. Uh, and like I said, there's a lot of really cool different delivery options that we're seeing right now. Um, you know, two, two of the largest carrier partners that we work with, both UPS and FedEx, um, have launched their own sort of competing services uh, that would compete and, and kind of push back against the Amazon lockboxes of the world, uh, where you can have it shipped to a nearby business. It might be like a CVS or a Walgreens or a local grocery store, a place that your customers are probably going to be going to if not every day, then pretty regularly. And if they can swing by and get their packages in a secure manner, maybe save a couple of bucks in, in doing so as well, because they're not shipping to a, a residential address, that, that's a fantastic way to, to provide a little bit of a value add to your customers that maybe your competitors aren't doing. Uh, and then and the last thing, I mean, transparency in, in terms of delivery dates is super critical. You know, everybody knows this. It's it's you know, almost goes without saying. But the one thing that I, I also tell customers a lot, which is something I think they all also love hearing, is that you know unnecessary options are unnecessary. And so what I mean when I say that is, let's say that typically you were going to show three different options to your customers at checkout. You're going to show ground, which is your sort of cheap economy option, and then a couple of expedited options, we'll say two day and then next day, right? So you're giving them enough options to make sure that they can get it in whatever time frame that they need. But ground sometimes takes one day, sometimes takes five days. And so let's say we're at a scenario where your customer is actually right around the corner. You're a local brand. They know you, they love you. They want to buy from your store. So yeah, not close enough to just go and swing by and pick it up, but pretty local nonetheless. So in that scenario, ground can get there in one day. If ground can get there in one day, why are you showing them two day air or next day air, which is going to be so much more expensive and get there in the same time frame or slower? You know, one it's an exercise that I work with merchants all day long on just like cutting out the unnecessary information, because while it seems like it should be pretty obvious, hey, if ground says it's going to get there tomorrow and next day air says it's going to get there tomorrow, then of course they're going to pick ground because it's going to be far cheaper. But, you know, unnecessary options just add confusion. And anytime that you're adding confusion to the checkout experience, you're going to see more abandoned carts. And so just doing some simple things to your shipping strategy, like cutting out the noise and cutting out the unnecessary information can be so hugely beneficial to that checkout experience. And when you're using Shipper HQ, it's a process that takes five to 10 minutes to do. And if that can have, you know, even a, a minor impact to your overall conversion rate, that's going to be a massive, massive, well spent time. Now, the other thing that I, I like to talk about with respect to shipping is, you know, about making sure that you're honing in on getting the right shipping rates.
you know, we see this all day long where merchants, they stand up a website, they, they get to shipping and then, you know, they, they just kind of look at it, like I said, as kind of checking a box. So they've got rates, they're doing it, they're fine. And then they, they do that dreaded audit a year or two later and they suddenly realize that, wow, we are absolutely getting crushed on shipping rates. You know, we're massively underrating and so it's killing our margins or in some cases we're overrating and maybe that's what we're getting all these abandoned carts from. You know, how do we hone in on that? It's really important to make sure that you start from a foundation of accurate shipping rates. You know, there's there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with Shipper HQ, certainly, uh, but you can do to kind of merchandise and, and make promotions and try out free shipping and, you know, do different things like that. But if you're not starting from a stable foundation of knowing what your actual costs are, it's going to be super difficult for you to understand if these promotions are actually profitable or if they're just making revenue, but you're actually losing money in the process. And so, you know, Shipper HQ, we can really help you hone in on the specifically accurate shipping rates. So you get that stable foundation and then you can start building and iterating and trying out different things. Now, we work with a variety of different carriers. I think it was over 40 I had in a previous slide. And what a lot of merchants are seemingly somewhat surprised about is that's both a combination of parcel and freight. You know, we're, we're seeing in the B2B space, so many companies have either gone through the, the sort of digital transformation and they're starting to sell online, or at least they're thinking about it right now. And they seem somewhat surprised that, that we can actually offer calculated real-time freight rates. You know, they figure that has to go through a sales rep who's gonna get a quote and then they're gonna go back and they'll negotiate and then they'll get a cut of PO. Um, it's, you know, a very, very time consuming and, and frankly expensive, expensive process. You know, all that, that labor uh, that's that's involved in that back and forth. You, know, you can automate those things directly on your website and, and customers appreciate the convenience. Sure, you're gonna get some people that still wanna phone in a, a PO and, and talk about it, but you know, a lot of people prefer because their time is important too. They wanna just go on your website, they can get a quote right there, they're just gonna place the order. And so you don't have to worry about writing down costs. You don't have to worry about those labor costs. You know, You can just do this directly on your website. One of the probably the most common things that I, I see a lot of merchants doing is, you know, when they first get started, they're they're just calculating shipping rates based on weight alone. And they figure like that, that's fine. You know, I might have a couple of big and bulky products that I need to worry about, but you know, I'll handle those separately. Um, and and generally it's not that big of a deal. And they're all wrong every single time, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, you know, carriers by and large don't rate based on simply the weight of items. They may tell you that they're rating based on weight, that's how they talk about it, but in reality, and this is not to say that they're being confusing, it's just the reality of, of you know have them having to run a business as well, is that they need to consider the weight, but also the dimensions of items. It's what they call the dimensional weight. Uh, they essentially are taking the dimensions, they're running it through a calculation, and they ultimately might say that, while this product weighs 10 pounds, the package and you know the dimensions and everything we're actually going to consider that to be 12 pounds uh, and that's what we're going to charge you for shipping well if you are charging your customer for 10 pounds at checkout but the carrier is charging you for 12 pounds you can see how very easily you can just start you know losing a couple of bucks here and there where it's not immediately obvious that you're getting killed but over time you're losing massive amounts of money and another thing that a lot of merchants just don't don't seem to realize in, until it starts to bite them is that a lot of carriers have different rate structures or at least different surcharges associated with shipping to residential versus commercial addresses. Um, and that's an easy thing as long as you have a system that can figure out which is which, uh, which shipper HQ certainly can. But um, you know, if you don't think about it, then you could either be massively underrating or overrating. Uh, and it might just be four or five dollars per order, but you know, if you're doing thousands of orders or even hundreds of thousands of orders, uh, then that can certainly add up. I actually worked with a, a large enterprise business who um, just the first thing that we did was just implement ad address validation for them just so they could figure out whether or not addresses are commercial or residential. They were just assuming it was probably always going to be residential and, and rating accordingly. And we were able to sa save them 40 grand a month in shipping costs that they otherwise wouldn't have had, they were, were just paying for uh, because they were just doing it wrong. You know, and it, it took an hour for them to set up. So that was that was a, a profitable hour for them. Um, and then one thing that, that we're seeing is more of a growing trend is the proliferation of international shipping. Now, I, I think the, the current climate has put a bit of a, a pause on a lot of brands' international expansion, but that's actually a really good time to 
look at how you're actually doing things, right? And and see if there's a way that you can do it smarter so that when you do start to really uh, funnel money and into marketing and, you know, acquisition, that you're doing so in a way that makes sense. I think, you know, a lot of merchants, you know, very quickly become aware, but a lot of customers are increasingly become, becoming aware that if you aren't showing duties and taxes, so you're shipping internationally, there's going to be customs and, and duties that you actually have to pay. You don't have to charge for them at checkout, but if you don't, then the customer is just going to be charged for them upon receipt of the package. Now they actually legally have the right to refuse that package. And then it's just going to be a super expensive international return for you, which you're probably not even going to want to go for. Uh, but it's also a frustrating experience for the customer. You know, it, if, if they don't know that this is coming, they just feel like they got, you know, a bait and switch situation. They're just getting hit with random fees upon receipt. And so we're seeing increasing numbers of brands want to uh, start showing duties and taxes at checkout. Um, and that's something that it definitely takes uh, some some accurate data, right? There's there's a bit of a process in terms of making sure that we properly understand and categorize the, the types of products and the tariff codes associated with those products to make sure that we are calculating those duties and taxes correctly. But it is a worthy endeavor to do because if you do have any plans to seriously invest in international expansion, it's gonna become an absolute must have very soon. You don't have to necessarily charge customers for those duties and taxes at checkout because there may be some variants, there may be some things that change over time because the tariff codes change constantly, but uh, at least just giving them a heads up that, hey, your shipping cost is gonna be $15, but we're estimating that there'll be $5 on top of that for international duties and taxes. Uh, that's gonna create such a better customer experience. It means that you don't have to worry about writing down those costs. It means that you can actually get that order to fulfill in, in, in its entirety. Um, and also you're likely to have a, a repeat customer because if you're the only one that's doing that and none of your competitors are, you're gonna look so far ahead of the game. There's gonna be so much more trust and transparency in that experience that customers are gonna wanna go to you and not to your competitors. Now, I, I talked a lot about you know shipping in general, and, and that's generally what I talk about all day long, because ultimately, you know, Shipper HQ, it's a super powerful platform, and, and our solution is focused on you know managing that that customer checkout experience for shipping. So built, bringing in all the different integrations and shipping options that they want to show, but also leveraging their own internal business logic to determine how rates are calculated, what options that you should show in any given scenario, and also how you want to merchandise and drive additional revenue. But ultimately, I think what customers care about is not the you know kind of nuts and bolts of the platform. It's really more about what it does for you. And ultimately, what Shipper HQ does for you is it gives you the control and flexibility to make sure that you're not writing down margins through inaccurate shipping costs, and that you can drive additional revenue and get some of those abandoned carts back in the first place um, through just a world class and enterprise level customer experience. I think the real value of our platform is you know, again, in, in both the, the kind of depth and breadth of the functionality that we offer, like I said, we've got 12 years of experience in writing shipping extensions and applications. And, you know, those learnings have, have built out a really robust platform. And I think the, the thing that I would really like brands to, to take away from this is that, you know, I know we're all trying to push back from the marketplaces and, and seeing how we can bring more customers to our, our direct channels. Um, and, you know, you have to compete with a pretty you know, trillion dollar enterprise experience. And that can be difficult, if not daunting to do. Um, what Shipper HQ really offers is those enterprise level tools that allow brands to compete on the same level as the massive marketplaces, but without a trillion dollar investment to do so. And so as a, a thank you offer that we are uh, doing to contribute to the virtual summit, uh, anybody who attends, anybody who's interested in talking about their shipping strategy, figuring out maybe where the leaky bucket is or how they can drive more revenue, add, you know, drive more conversions at checkout, we're offering all attendees a free 30 minute strategy consultation. Um, so if anyone's interested in getting in touch, talking about shipping, I know y'all love it. Uh, my contact information is right over here. We'd love to have that conversation with you. Awesome, thank you, Jared. Um, and piggybacking off shipping, we have returns up next. So I'd like to welcome Stephanie Lacey from Happy Returns onto the stage. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks, Gina. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining today. Um, and thank you for giving me a reason to put on clothing that doesn't have a high percentage of spandex in it. It feels very nice. Um, 
I'm Stephanie Lacey. Like I said, I'm the Director of Enterprise Partnerships here at Happy Returns um, and excited to be here talking about returns with you guys. Probably everyone's second favorite topic behind shipping. Um, so what I wanted to do is start with giving you guys a brief overview of what exactly Happy Returns does. Um, we are the industry's only comprehensive return solution. Um, our retail partners offer their customers um, a branded online and exchange uh, return and exchange service to allow them to easily return or exchange items with maximum flexibility for getting their items back to um, back to the retailer. Um, we have a return bar network, which is 700 physical locations nationwide, um, where a customer can easily return or exchange an item without printing or having to go through packaging um, in just under 60 seconds and receive their refund immediately. Um, after that, all items that have been returned are bulk shipped back to um, our warehouses in eco-friendly reusable boxes, um, leveraging our low carrier rates and aggregated shipping for economies of scale. Um, so like I said, those go back to our regional return hubs um, where we can handle sorting, processing, um, and ultimately disposition to um, the final destination. Um, so, so before we uh, dive into the meat of it, um, just wanted to uh, have you guys take a peek at our poll question, um, which looks like it's actually not up yet, but, um, oh, there it is. What percentage of customers are unlikely uh, to shop at a brand again after a painful return experience? Um, this, I think, is highly relevant um, to today's um, ecosystem in retail, given that, um, you know, the, the cost to acquire a new retailer is so, or, I'm sorry, a new customer is so tremendous. Um, so retailers simply can't afford um, to give their customers a painful return experience. Um, so, you know, the correct answer here is actually C, 87%, um, which is incredibly high. Um, so bearing that all in mind, let's dive into um, the content for today. Um, so on top of customer retention, today's uh, retailers are really focused on reducing costs um, and retaining sales. Um, this is more important than ever, I think, um, given everything that's going on in retail um, as a result of COVID. Um, so, you know, you may ask, how can Happy Returns help retailers um, cut costs? So, you know, starting at the beginning of the life cycle of a return, um, our goal is to help retailers retain revenue. Um, and we're able to do that by turning refunds into exchanges. Um, and we do this in a way that makes it super easy for the retailers um, and customer to do so. Um, so to initiate a return, um, the customer is going to authenticate themselves using their um, order number and billing zip, zip code. Um, they're going to select the customized return reason for the item. Um, from there, we're able to select the next bigger size if the customer is saying that it's a, a fit issue due to it being too small. We then can give options on how the customer can get the item back to the retailer um, and a very clear explanation that they're returning a large and getting an extra large in exchange. Um, and from there, all they need to do is submit their return. Um, so we're able to, to handle this kind of um, initiation of a return or exchange through a direct integration with the e-commerce platform. Um, so BigCommerce, for example, is one of our partners. We've got an integration with them um, and retailers who are um, part of that, um, that work on BigCommerce can um, integrate very easily to provide this to their customers. Um, our software is fully branded um, for the retailer and allows your customer um, to kind of have that in-person shopping experience while they're online um, by suggesting a different size if they're returning an item for a fit issue. Um, and on average, our retail partners see an increase in exchanges of just over 30%. So um, huge contribution to the bottom line in terms of retaining revenue. Um, the other thing that's tremendously important um, today for retailers is increasing loyalty with their customers. Um, you know, as we chatted briefly about in the beginning, 87% um, of shoppers are not going to come back to a brand after a painful return experience. Um, and we know that even the majority of millennials who are very comfortable with doing things online prefer an in-person return experience. Um, so by giving your customers an in-person return option that is box-free, label-free, and probably more important than ever today, contact-free um, in just under 60 seconds and that immediate refund, you're going to win some serious loyalty points uh, with your customers. 
Um, and this has been proven time and again with the net promoter score, uh, survey results that Happy Returns receives. Um, our lifetime average as a company since we um, started doing this back in 2015 is um, a 95. Um, just to give you guys some context, um, Nordstrom, who's kind of considered best in class for customer service, um, their average NPS is an 80. So it's a score we're incredibly proud of. Um, and we continually see comments from our retail partners and customers um, to the tune of, I'm more likely to keep shopping with this retailer so long as they offer happy returns. Um, so ultimately, you know, increased loyalty um, is going to lead to a big increase in lifetime value of each of your customers um, and ultimately an, an increase in sales. Um, partnering with Happy Returns will also help lower the um, reverse logistics costs for a retailer. Um, with our return bar solution, your customers um, are actually tackling that first mile um, of getting a return item back to the retailer. Um, you know, I think we often think about last mile when it comes to delivery um, and how that can be such a game changer in terms of cost for a retailer. Well, the same is true um, for returns. So by having a customer actually walk that item into a location where and consolidate and ship in aggregate um, is a huge cost reducer for retailers. Um, and then finally, because Happy Returns does such a large volume um, of return shipping across our customer base, we've been able to negotiate um, very competitive carrier rates. Um, and our retailers have the option to use those shipping rates for their um, returns by mail, whether those returns are going um, directly to their warehouse um, or if they are coming to Happy Returns um, regional hubs first for um, processing um, before they ultimately end up back at the retailer. Um, and then finally, this is a trend that we continue to see in retail, um, and that is sustainability. Um, we really don't think this um, is a trend that's going anywhere. It's, it's here to stay. Um, and so Happy Returns has been very focused on helping retailers make their um, supply chains more sustainable. 61% um, of shoppers today are saying that they are only buying from businesses um, that do have sustainable business practices. Um, so one of the ways we're able to help customers do this is uh, retailers rather do this is exactly what we were just talking about in terms of consolidated shipping. So um, instead of having 15 um, items being returned from 15 customers in 15 different boxes, um, it's a tremendous amount of, of waste, both in terms of the cardboard boxes um, and also the amount of um, carbon put out to put um, to return each of those items individually. Um, so because they're aggregated at our return bar, um, and also because the, those aggregated shipments are done in um, eco-friendly, cardboard-free packaging, like you're seeing on the screen here, um, that is significantly um, contributing to uh, sustainability in our retail partners' supply chains. Um, and in fact, some of our partners are even asking that um, their final shipment of return items come back to their warehouses or their 3PLs um, in these uh, eco-friendly reusable boxes. Um, so they can now say that any of their items that um, are returned through a return bar have a totally cardboard-free return experience, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, so just to kind of summarize the four main points that we just talked about, um, Happy Returns is able to retain revenue for retailers um, by turning what might have been a refund into an exchange with that in-person shopping experience um, of being able to determine, um, you know, different size uh, sizes available for any fit issues. Um, we can also power returns and exchanges for other product variants as well. Um, you know, we're able to raise loyalty with a painless in-person return experience, um, lower reverse logistics costs through aggregated shipping, um, as well as competitive carrier rates. Um, and then finally, ship in reusable packaging, which contributes to the sustainability of a retailer's supply chain. So taking a look at how one of our um, retail partners was able to um, tackle this, Rothy's, they are a women's shoe brand out of San Francisco. Um, they are very focused on sustainability. Their shoes, um, if you're not familiar, are actually made um, from recycled plastic water bottles. Um, and, you know, they had a problem that is pretty common, especially in the apparel and footwear vertical, where they had an incredibly high return rate as a result of um, size and fit issues. And so their goal was to reduce refunds um, and cut down the cost of their returns. Um, and they were able to achieve that with happy returns by implementing our online return and exchange service. 
um, to promote those one-click exchanges, which are based on, um, you know, a customer needing the next bigger size or the next smaller size. Um, this ultimately led to a very positive impact on customer experience, um, a reduced cost in reverse logistics, um, as well as a, a boosted um, exchange rate for them. We worked really closely with Heather Howard, who's their VP of Ops on implementing this solution. Um, and her big takeaway um, on the project was that our exchange rate increased after we switched to Happy Returns online return solution. Our customers love it, our net return rate is down, and the Happy Returns team has been fantastic to work with. Um, so always, always nice to hear those things from our retail partners. Um, and I think um, you know the, the proof is in the experience. Um, so lastly, what I wanted to just mention briefly, um, outside of all of the ways that um, Happy Returns solution inherently um, reduces costs to retailers, um, as, part of our, as part of our contribution um, to the webinar today, we're offering a two-month free trial um, for retailers who are on the BigCommerce platform, um, as well as Shopify and Shopify Plus. Um, to, to check out our software, um, try it out, see um, how your customers like it, um, uh, experience it for yourself, um, and then, uh, you know, hopefully continue to, to work with us. Um, thank you, Gina. Thanks for having us today. Um, look forward to uh, hearing some of your questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, big fan of eco-friendly anything. I am one of those consumers that always looks to a brand's ethics, especially their return policies. Nothing uh, is a bigger pet peeve of mine than seeing all of those Amazon mailers pile up in my garbage room and seeing no place to return them or recycle them. So thank you, happy returns. Um, last but not least, we have Kristen Little from Payhelm. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to him and it will be followed by questions. So everyone, make sure you have your questions in the questions tab. Also, I've been providing some documents and resources from some of our partners. Um, you can check those out. They're all via Google links. Um, and yeah, without further ado, uh, Christian is up next. Hello, sorry there. My computer was having some technical difficulties. Uh, sorry for the delay. So my name is Chris. I'm from payhelm.com. We are an analytics provider and we connect all of your data using Google Analytics, your big commerce store, your payment systems. And we tie it all together. So rather than kind of go through a really detailed explanation of what we do, I'm going to kind of just show you what we do. Let me just jump here. So I always like to start off with this quote by Jeffrey Moore, and it's a really good example of what we do. Uh, the quote is that without big data, you're blind and deaf in the middle of a freeway. And this is really true. Uh, in today's day and age, there is so much data flowing around the internet that it's really hard to know what's there, or what's not there. What you can see is not necessarily what's really going on. So it's really important that you get a really strong hold on what data you have and how you're reporting on it. And that's what Payhelm does. So Payhelm collects information from your big commerce store, and it also connects to, say, your PayPal account and your Google Analytics and a few other places, and it pulls it all together, and it gives you a bunch of amazing summary reports. So you can see an example on my slide here. This is the, the default reporting that you see, and you might notice that this is really similar to what you get with almost any kind of analytics platform. So it gives you summary results. Now, what makes Payhelm different in what we can give you is this section on the left here. We have tied in the ability to segment your data in pretty much any way you can think of. So if you wanna dig into say specific customer segments or you wanna look at where your shipments are going and the types of customers buying in those specific regions or you wanna look at 
different segments for marketing purposes, for things like that, we tie that all in and we map it all together using all your different platforms in one place. So it lets you segment your data into really granular different pieces and you can use that to make better decisions for your business. So the common problems that we see with data challenges, uh, especially with web analytics is first, you know what you know, and that is, you know how much money you're making, how many orders you're getting, things like that. But oftentimes there's two other parts to your data. There's what you know you don't know, and then what you don't know you don't know. This is a, a really popular thing that pops up in like philosophy courses uh, in university. And it's a really big deal because what you don't know that you don't know, that is often 90% of the data that's flowing out there. And it's a matter of trying to figure out what it is and how do you get to it. So here's a good example. This is a, a screenshot of a big commerce store. And you can see right off the bat with their analytics, we can see how much traffic the store got, how many add to cart sales, the conversion rate, the average order value, you know, the general summary metrics that every website owner needs to see. But what you don't know is, let's take a look at, in the bottom right corner there, we see 2,642 people abandon the cart. Well, why did they abandon? you don't really get a lot of that insights from a lot of places. So we try and answer those types of questions so you can improve your conversion rate, get higher sales, improve your overall revenue. And taking this further, what are things that you don't know that you don't know? Well, what traffic sources convert better or give you better higher average order value? Are there specific segments that you don't know about? So maybe there's specific buckets of customers that are highly profitable, but they're kind of off your radar, or maybe it's buried in some of your data that you just haven't been able to uncover it. Or maybe there's customer segments that are being underserved and they could be highly profitable, but maybe they're a really small focus right now in your current marketing efforts. So what we do is we try and uncover all this data and make it really presentable for you. So these sections, the what you don't know and what you know you don't know, they're kind of the key to scaling your business. And until you can answer these questions, it's, you're kind of limiting yourself. That's why we built PayHelm is to answer a lot of this information. And I'm gonna walk you through a couple of examples here. So on this slide here, what you see are kind of the standard metrics that you'll get from almost every website platform. We give you this information and sometimes they'll tell you, okay, here's all the orders and where they all went and things like that. But they don't often give you a lot more detail on that. This exact same store that we plugged into PayHelm, when a few seconds we could see in this particular case, their traffic from Bing was converting 52% more revenue than every other traffic source they were getting. So right there, within a few seconds of connecting your account to us, we could see where your biggest profitability options are. So then we look at, okay, how do we take what's going on with Bing? Why is it getting twice as many average items in the cart compared to everything else? And how can we apply that to your site and grow it more? So a couple of success stories of how we've done this. I'll, I've got two I want to show you. The first was a big commerce store that was averaging 500 orders a month with $130,000 of revenue. Now, this, this customer came to us because what they were doing is finding they had to generate this brand report to their resellers because this customer was basically reselling products from another source. And they had to pay out 20 different partners based on how much sales they got and what they were doing every month is at the end of every month, they would export all of their orders from Big Commerce into a spreadsheet, and then they do a bunch of manual work to try and line it up and figure out how much do they pay out to each partner. They told us they were spending 10 hours every month doing this. So what we did was we took a sample of their report, we built it into PayHelm, and now the exact reporting that they have that they were spending 10 hours a month on, they can get it in about two seconds in their site. So it makes it really, really fast and easy. It gives them all the data they want. It saved an entire day of their time that they would normally spend doing this kind of stuff. Better still, this custom report that we built into PayHelm is now available to every PayHelm user. So every time a customer comes to us asking for a new report or they want more insights or they have ideas of what they'd like to see, we build it out, we put it into the platform and we unlock it for everybody. This is another really great example that we have. So we had uh, one customer come to us that has a big commerce store and they were doing $1.4 million in revenue a month with 900 orders. And this customer took advantage of big commerce's uh, product groups or customer groups. 
Customer groups are available on the higher tiers of e-commerce. They let you kind of segment your customers and give them discounts depending on the group and such. The problem was that they didn't really have a lot of insight or reporting into those customer groups with uh, what big commerce was giving them. So we were looking at how can we improve that? So what we did was we actually added customer group segmentation into our platform so we can drill into each individual segment of your customer groups and you can then layer on all the other filters we have. So we could see, okay, customer group B, and then we could drill into where their orders were shipping, their average order value, all those different segments. So there's about 100 different ways you can drill into the data here. And now they can do that. And again, when we built this out for this user, we unlocked it for every single user on PayHelm. So that's kind of a recurring theme with our businesses. When a customer comes to us asking for help or wanting customer reports, we build it. Once they sign off and they're happy with it, we unleash it for everybody. It's a really unique way of building up all these custom reports and it kind of makes the entire uh, environment awesome for all of our users because we're always adding these new abilities for them. Uh, as part of uh, an attendee for this webinar, we're offering essentially an unlimited free trial to anyone that signs up with PayHelm and wants to try us out. So all you need to do is come to our website, connect your big commerce store and talk to us about what kind of custom reports you were looking for. And you won't pay a penny for PayHelm until we've built it up to your satisfaction. So our goal is that we want to be constantly growing the product, adding new features, and we're using this approach to do it. So you come to us, you tell us what you want, and we will build it for you, and you don't have to pay for it until it's all set up and running in exactly the way you want. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I can be reached at chris at payhelm.com. Thank you so much, Chris. That was great. So um, we're just at the three uh, three o'clock mark uh, for everyone on Eastern time. We're gonna do a quick round of Q and A uh, based on what's in the questions tab. So if you have any last minute questions, ask them now. Um, you know, since Chris just spoke, Chris, uh, one question is, what's the difference between the data and the insights that you get in PayHelm versus Google Analytics? Yeah, this is a question we get asked a lot. Uh, the main difference is that Google Analytics is kind of a first pass system. So it looks at a customer when it, they come to your website the first time, and it doesn't really record a lot after they come back, or if it does, it counts them as a separate visitor. So PayHelm, what we do is we actually tie that all together and we tie it in with your payment processor and your cart system so that we can see how many times a customer came back. We can tie it into your Google Analytics data and your UTM tags so we can see all that data Additionally, we can build out custom reports better than what Google Analytics does, and we do it for free. When you try and build out a custom report in Google Analytics, you have to basically click and drag all over their interface, and it's a little bit messy and confusing. We actually do it for you. So we just show you, you tell us what you want, and we build it in, and then you just have to click one button, and it's there. Awesome, great. Uh, next question is for uh, Stephanie. So we know that multi-channel is huge right now. A lot of brands are looking to expand onto marketplaces um, in addition to say their big commerce store. Um, and I know that there's a lot of returns providers that um, really only work with first party uh, store storefronts. So um, what flexibility does Happy Returns uh, provide for omni-channel, multi-channel sellers? Yeah, great question. Um, thanks, Ellie, for asking that. Um, yes, we um, can certainly talk about that in more depth, and I would encourage you um, to contact me directly. Um, the short answer is um, yes, we have some flexibility on um, what platform we integrate with. Um, so essentially, as long as we have access to uh, the source of truth for your orders, um, we can help power, um, at the very least, what we would call a walk-up return at a return bar, um, where the customer could uh, simply just bring their item in and authenticate using um, email address as opposed to um, order number. Um, but definitely worth a follow-up conversation. Um, there's some complexities involved, um, as I'm sure we all can imagine. So thank you, Ellie. Please reach out. Awesome. Um, and Sasha, and this came in around your section. Um, with big commerce, can you show different products or prices based on a consumer profile? Yeah, absolutely. That was that was one of the openness of the platform and the flexibility that I talked about. Where it's um, there's a concept of customer groups, and essentially you can um, have your customers belong to multiple customer groups. And when you create your products, your pricing, um, you can have products and pricing based on customer groups. So only the right price will show up to the members of that customer group. So very easy to do. 
no development effort required for you to be able to do that. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. Um, I mean, I, that's I didn't even know stores could do that, but um, yeah. that's amazing uh, functionality from Big Commerce. And lastly, Jared at Shipper HQ, um, mm -hmm. just can you put different shipping rules? We have uh, a lot of international sellers um, that have registered, and just wanted to know kind of the workarounds or how Shipper HQ kind of supports international sellers and um, uh, sorry, international customers. Well, yeah, absolutely. Be. So we're, we're all about control and flexibility and giving that to the merchant. So you can build specific rules and, and make, you know, sort of conditional logic that is conditional based on specific types of items or groups of items, specific countries. Um, and that can be you know, individual countries, groups of countries. It can be down to an individual postcode level or whatever region you need to define. It can be based on weight, on cart subtotal, on quantity or any combination therein. Uh, so rules can be very broadly applicable or very fine tuned and specific to a certain scenario. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're five minutes over the hour. So I'm going to end the webinar here uh, a, um, in about a minute or so once it processes. But thank you. Anytime you want to rewatch it or rewatch yesterday's section, you can just use your uh, login information and you'll be redirected right here. So everyone have a nice day, stay safe, and thank you again for all of our presenters. Thanks everyone, take care, thank you. stay safe.